Ася, мы все видим, но не слышим. Is that better? <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to just start with the most recent exhibition of Jasper's at the gallery that he will actually be um, talking about and very briefly. But since I'm a little concerned about my technical situation, I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can through my images before my laptop dies. So here we go. This is the installation views of the exhibition. The exhibition was called Admiral's Headache, and Jasper will explain more specifically what that is about. Um, these, so these are all photographs, but made out of sculpture, out of paper. But the process, in fact, is much more complicated, and it varies image to image and series to series. In this particular series, which is about Dutch slavery and colonialism, uh, and it was based on his travels to Curacao. He did a two month residency there. This work started physically there and then the rest of it was made in his studio in Amsterdam. And, but the process in fact has a deep layer of research, another layer of um, computers, but the computers come in and out and then the photograph is made, but there's also several photographs. So. In fact, it's, it's an interweaving of technology, looking, thinking, reading, and just responding to his personal experience as somebody who's Dutch and who's really deeply interested in these social and political and historical aspects of specifically Dutch colonialism. So here's an image of somebody just for you to see the scale. Most of his works are quite large. This work is called uh, the Ad Ad Brigadier. And I'm just gonna very quickly go through these because you'll be able to see more of them in Jasper's presentation. This is a very large work and um, that initial surface where the kind of river is, is made out of a reflective material and then further kind of manipulated in, with the computer called refinery. So I'm just gonna go kind of quickly through these again, cause I'm noticing I've got 7%. This is called Bastion. This was the image that Evelina was mentioning. It's called Galleon. And this really reflects uh, the beginnings of Jasper's work, which were fundamentally about the process of drawing and physically making sculpture that has a layer of drawing on top of it. And you can really see it in this work. You can see kind of the, um, the clouds, you can see the mark making there, the shadows of the sails. So there's a lot of hints in this image that show you that it's a physically made object that's then being photographed. So this is the preceding exhibition by Jasper that had far more computer manipulation, both before and after. This was called the Brazilian Suitcase. And I'll just very quickly read to you um, about that. It's basically a travelogue of an imaginary expedition in search of a lost civilization in the Amazon. But in actual fact, Jasper visited Brazil and did a lot of research on site. He went to museums, he took 3D images, um, and he basically was responding to, to being there, to researching that history, and, and really very much it's also a response to kind of the story of the, the lost city of Z. If anyone is familiar with that book, and then it was also a movie. So it's based on numerous reports of explorers, anthropologists, and documentary filmmakers, and the artist is using photographs and videos shot during his trip to the Amazon rainforest combined with objects made in the studio and computer generated images, as well as archival footage of real expeditions. So there's a constant back and forth between the real, that which is touched by the artist's hand and the imaginary, which is created with the magical alchemy of the computer. This is a beautiful image, again, with a heavy dose of research. And again, this is all imaginary. Um, it's basically like a plane crash of these colonists coming to some wild quote unquote native part of Brazil. And then it's this encounter between the natives and these colonists in a plane. And then they're building a little temple. 
This is a lake image that he did both in reality so that that streak of light in fact is actually made by him running through the woods. But there's also different exposures in here and different levels of melding with the computer. This is a series of very small black and white images that is supposed to resemble a documentary black and white image that would have like a film that would have been shot by these, again, very fictional explorers. And now quickly, we're going to go to his preceding show, which in some ways really does connect with that galleon image. The, it's a mostly black and white series. These are all individual sculptures, again, made in the studio. And they're all supposed to be from the point of view of an actual person who lived who was a hermit. So he lived for 23 years in Maine, in the woods, with nothing but a radio for his source of information. And Jasper was very fascinated with this idea of somebody who has no visual impetus to actual real life events. And Jasper tried to imagine himself as this hermit. He tried to go back in time in about 20 years. So kind of a recent past for him, events that were important like Chernobyl or Hurricane Katrina or the tsunami that happened in Asia. And he tried to imagine if he were a hermit and had no visual cues, if he only heard about these news events on the radio, how would he envision them? So in a way it was, creating a tabula rasa, if you will. It was going against all of his impetus, all of his process as an artist, which is huge immersion into visual data, uh, visual detritus, museums, images, postcards, movies, everything. And here he was doing the exact opposite and trying to imagine what it would be like to imagine what say Chernobyl could be looking like. So for instance, this is this imaginary view of the actual tsunami that happened. And it's a huge image. But you, as you can see, these houses look nothing like a Japanese house. So he's, he's giving you these clues of how unreal this could be. This image is quite fantastical. It's about Waco, which if you will recall, it was like a, a raid in Texas and there was a huge fire but in Jasper's imagination, it becomes almost like a grim fairy tale. And here we have an image that's supposed to be of Hurricane Katrina. And it looks like this kind of classic uh, plantation house. And in fact, some of that is made with lace. Some of that is made with paper. Um, and they're supposed to be kind of imaginary floats that ended up on top of the roof. So of course that, that didn't actually happen because Hurricane Katrina didn't happen during Mardi Gras. But as a European and as someone trying to pretend to be this person with no information, this is the kind of story that Jasper is imagining. And I'll end with this image. I'm so thankful I still have a battery. So this is actually supposed to be the Ceausescu's, the, which I'm sure most of my audience will know was the, the uh, Romanian dictators and they were found in the middle of the night and basically killed. But, um, you know, this just looks like two people in pajamas and you can see how beautifully everything is made out of paper and it just takes something that's horrific and changes it again into almost like a dream or a fable or something that doesn't really connect with the actual event until you're told what it is. And even then, sometimes that distance is too long to bridge. So with that, um, I really didn't discuss his current show because I really want Jasper to engage with you guys. I think I'm sure you all want to hear from Jasper. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to give <clears throat> you Jasper. Hi. Thank you, Asha. Uh, Asha, thank you for the introduction. Um, Will you be here later when we uh, are finished? Yes, I'm just going to switch to my other, my iPad, so. <laughs> OK, no fun. problem. Yeah. OK, well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me for this. Um, I'm really honored to, to be participating. So as I just said, she gave like a, an introduction of my work. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit more about the Atmos Headache, which was my latest work. but. 
it's also important for me to tell about this project because it kind of uh, binds together several previous projects. So for me, it's quite important that I have the all the layers in the right order. And I also have the feeling that everything is kind of connected with each other. So for me, this is a kind of like a, a, a playbook um, uh, thing that I would do with this kind of topics. So let me open my presentation for a second. Yeah. Um, I will be showing the presentation mostly. I will be switching sometimes between me and the presentation because I have brought some objects uh, with me that are actually in the images. I did a previous presentation like this uh, a few weeks ago. And that one I did at my studio where I had all the models present and I could show them all. But uh, due to the time and different circumstances, uh, I'm at home right now and I brought a few objects. Uh, so you can get a sense of the scale and the way how it's built. So, uh, well, without further ado, let's start. Uh, screen share. Can you see my screen okay now? Yes, we can. Okay. Mm. Uh, as Isa said, I, um, in 2017, I went to, uh, to Curaçao, uh, which used to be a, a colony of the, of the Netherlands. Um, it's a small island, which is close to Venezuela. And it was mostly used as a slave port. Uh, and also as a slave market uh, in the 18th and uh, the 19th century, in the 70s as well. Um, these days, Curaçao is mostly known for its tourists. So it's a kind of a sun, like Barbados, a, a sun, sea, beach, holiday. That's where most Dutch people know it from. I was invited to work there for uh, three months and uh, do a little research on everything. Uh, well, the first thing I actually noticed in Curaçao uh, was this building style that you can see here um, is also a typical Dutch building style. So this style, the way it's ornamented, the way uh, the, the facades are designed is really something which I know from my childhood and from my own reference uh, color. But in this case, in Curaçao, of course, they uh, painted all of them in very bright colors and everything's placed out of context because of this. So I started reading a little bit more about uh, these buildings. So why do these buildings look so specific like this uh, in Curaçao? So before I went to Curaçao, I also already did a really extensive study on what this kind of architecture meant uh, inside of the colony. Well, here can, you can see another example. Um, this is called a land house. And on first sight, it actually looks like something which could be a, a normal Dutch farm. If you drive around here in the countryside, a lot of Dutch farms will look like this. But there's a small difference because this one is a little bit designed like a fortress. Uh, and it's also completely confined. It's a confined space. And third of all, these colors, uh, and the whole atmosphere is completely different than what you expect from a Dutch farm. So studying this, then you find out actually that it's comparable to one of the plantation houses in the US. Uh, this used to be where the slave owner was living and there's like a large fence around it, a stone fence, a wall, uh, which kept, keeps everything, the white people inside and the black people outside. So that was all, the whole idea. All of these things were built on a hill, all these houses, so they could actually see each other and communicate with each other uh, because they were up so high. Uh, for instance, they had a hole in the, in the top of the facade where they used fire to communicate between those uh, buildings, between those land houses. I will tell more about this later. Um, as you can see here, this is for me, a normal picture of a Dutch interior, but this is completely kind of like migrated uh, from Holland to Amsterdam. So visiting this building, uh, uh, this museum, this Landhout Museum, I came in and it, it feels like Dutch uh, gezelligheid. It's a word for coziness. Uh, completely fixed on something in the tropics. So there was already like a kind of a, 
a telltale sign for me that there was like culturally something really uh, kind of messed up in a way. Um, so looking at those buildings, I noticed that they actually all look alike. They all use the same elements, like these uh, uh, the hatches that you see, the windows are built, the way the ornaments are used. So it kind of looked modular to me. So driving around the island, walking around the island, I saw a lot of things that kind of look the same and could be used in a different sense. This also goes for uh, like uh, other buildings, but also smaller things like weapons or clothing. Everything looked kind of modular in a way. And here I was at Kura Holanda, which is a museum um, where I also use the costumes uh, uh, to make my uh, 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 presentation. I will tell you a little bit more about these costumes later. First about these modules. So I, I go around on this island and drive around and I see all these, these places that kind of look the same. And the island is quite, it's quite arid, it's quite barren as well. There's not a lot of water. So they use salt pans um, to make money. So you have to understand in, in, the, in the beginning, they used um, chocolate, tobacco, uh, and sugar and these kind of things to uh, kind, of, kind of make a profit. But it didn't work. The, the ground was much too arid. So they kind of changed their, uh, their plan to salt pans, but unfortunately also the slave trade. So it was a really a well-known place in the whole of the Caribbean. But this idea of this barren land, which is quite flat, uh, and kind of placing these buildings on top of them felt actually like a science fiction movie. So I was thinking about this idea, how can I make it more modular? How can I, I make these buildings more modular and also give them more the feeling that they're kind of deployed on this, uh, on this terrain? So for me, that was a good starting point because I could cut off all the other things and see what the, the, the ultimate dramatic effect would be if I kind of uh, transpose that idea. And here you can see it again. It's like once you see the elements, you see them repeating and you can almost imagine you can build everything like this in the same way. Well, the, the interesting thing that also this whole idea of the modular building also comes back in those ships. All the 18th century merchant ships all have this kind of same way of using the ornaments, but also the way it's built. So for me, I started thinking about the idea of these modules. They could also be part of a building, but also part of a ship. So I started kind of interchanging these two in ideas. And I started making these kind of hybrids, as you see here, uh, between a ship and a building. So I was just looking around, see what I can do about this, what kind of solution I could find. And then I thought I have to build one standard module. And from the idea of that module, I'm just kind of going to expand that idea and build a whole system around it to uh, kind of move those modules around the island. So the whole idea about this alien invasion is that spaceships land, um, they leave their cargo behind. The cargo kind of deploys on, on the alien planet and kind of takes over the planet. That's how it mostly goes in science fiction movies. So I started like really simple designing something like this, which, which is like really small. Um, everything I do and everything I did in this project is made completely out of paper. Everything. Um, I have cut everything out. So I've designed everything myself and drawn everything myself you've seen here. Uh, I do have a machine which can cut out shapes like this because this is like really, really small, uh, like this big. Um, so with that tool and with my computer, of course, I could build com very complex 3D models in paper to fold together and glue together and make a complete world out of it. So for instance, um, I will go back to me again. And here, for instance, um, 
I have a crane. I have to find myself back. Wait a second. Yeah. Well, here you can see the way it's built generally. So this was all cut out of paper and the designs, like everything here on it, all the wood engravings, the, the nails, the ropes. I designed everything separately and bring it all together in this three model, 3D model. As you can see, the back is not uh, textured because I'm not gonna photograph it. So, so that's how it's done. Partly. So now we go back to share screen. There we go. So after designing this part of the container, designing this unit, I also had to design a ship, which is part container and part house. So I was really thinking hard about this. And the first thing I actually came up with was a container ship, which was like invented in the 50s. They kind of made modular shapes out of all containers which is now the biggest invention, some people say, from the, from the 20th century. And I tried to make kind of a 18th century version of a container ship. Let me put it like that. And this is the design I eventually came up with. So this is quite a normal boat. And the top you see here on this side, you can actually lift it off uh, from the ship and deploy it somewhere else. You will see that in a minute. Here you see a normal, normal container uh, crane, uh, which I also had to redesign, of course. So I needed a ship, I needed a crane, a transport system, all the logistics, all the everything, infrastructure. So I redesigned the whole island and laid down the whole infrastructure of the island based on the old one and made a whole new one. So this is an example of the kind of cranes I designed to get these kind of units off and lift them somewhere else. And this is a part of the crane itself I used for lifting these containers. This here is a, the actual fortress I designed to get those ships in. So actually the ships are coming from above here, above in the left, the kind of rear part like this, doot, 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 and they come in and the crane comes above, lifts the floors off and brings them away in little carts. So as you can see here, the whole situation, which I, this is all computer design. This is not uh, with paper. This is just a sketch to get my reference and to know what I can build and what I should build. And the situation you see here is one ship coming in, deploying its cargo, or it is deployed actually by the cranes. Um, it's put on these, small carts you can see here with the cart wheels, uh, driven around the island, taken off again by another crane and added it together as one big land house. So that all that, all that means that's why I worked on it for two and a half years. Uh, I had to design the harbor and the whole system because everything had to work exactly like I wanted it to work. So. There's no, you know, there's no half measures there. This is also one of the houses I designed. Okay, I'm going to go back to myself. Wait a second. Yeah. And here you can see, so it, this is on a different scale than the thing you saw before. This is a much larger scale. As you can see, it's palm trees on it, but from close, you can see all the details on it. This is the front. So- Can you tilt a little bit? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, thank you. So this is all just out of a normal printer, um, glued on, on cardboard or thicker paper and cut out by hand or cut out by that machine. <clears throat> and what you see here is actually the blueprint for what you just saw. So the thing you just saw, 
all the objects are kind of cut out from this one and fold together in 3D. That's a lot of work. So this is me building it in the studio. So after I had that whole map, I kind of printed that map on a surface of, uh, I don't know, six, seven feet and started with uh, aluminum foil and started kind of recreating that whole harbor as I uh, designed it. Eventually I got rid of the aluminum foil and I used the mirror, which is much uh, easier to, uh, to use. And here you can see a detail uh, of the loading system, what you see here. So you see on the right, you see one ship which has kind of uh, uh, dropped this container. And on the left side, you see one of those containers hanging on the crane. Uh, and left below, you see one of the cards. So it's kind of like lowering down. It's kind of placed on the cards and driving to his destination. So this is kind of everything bound together. And this is the whole picture here. So you can see here the whole system. And you can see two boats leaving the harbor. Just one uh, unit still hanging there. And all this rest of this stuff is part of a bigger uh, refinery system. It has all the elements of Curacao. People from Curacao know this image because all the facades that I used are actual facades of Curacao. But of course, they see their complete world uh, turned upside down uh, and changed. Uh, but they do recognize the buildings. The ship, uh, the container, the ship. I mean, I couldn't miss it. And that's the first thing I start building there, completely designing out of pencil with no reference uh, and just building and building. And here you can see one version with uh, uh, three floors on it. It looks completely ridiculous because a normal galleon or a no normal merchant ship would be much more dynamic, of course, and would probably sink with a configuration like this. Um, but it looks bulky and ugly and it has the feeling of a, of a sea container of a container ship. So I was quite happy with the, the, uh, the aggressiveness of, uh, of the whole thing. And you can see those cannons up close. Uh, I designed the background separately. So this is quite big. So the foreground was the ship, of course. The ocean I also printed out on paper. And here you can see some details of all this, all the kind of clouds of whiffs or puffs, puffs of smoke uh, coming out of the cannons. And if you look closely, you can also see a little bit of the iron wire that's used to connect everything together, traces of glue, of course, uh, and of course, a trace of paper. So in looking at those images, and that's the all, always the nice thing that from a distance of 10 or 20 centimeters, you can kind of feel the material. So you kind of in touch with how it's made. But if you take like a meter or I don't know, three, four feet back, um, then you have this pictorial view of an image and it kind of resonates as an image in your head. So shifting those distances become, becoming close and far away uh, makes it even stranger and you have to kind of replace every time, which is also something I really like about uh, this work. And this is the final image then. As I said, it's not, uh, it's probably not seaworthy, but uh, it has the idea of the battery that I wanted. It's also just a kind of like a, a pompous or hubris uh, display of masculinity in a way, which was the whole 18th century, by the way. This is an actually uh, actual land house. And as you can see, those mountains in the back uh, are no mountains, they're actually hills. Uh, all, all of them had a land house and all of them would communicate. And if there was a problem on one side of the island, they can get uh, the message across uh, in five minutes to the other side by giving light signals through those little holes uh, in the facade. So the more abstract it became the idea uh, the, the closer I got to the idea that the aliens themselves, or the Dutch in this case, 
are completely closed off from the world. So the black people that work there are the actual fuel of the whole system. And they're kind of kept away from all humanity, all the, the, all the human factors that, that make us humans and keep it behind the facade. So everything's closed down. Uh, everything's hidden or protected. So there's no way to make any human contact there. So that, that's what made this system so hard. And the reason why I came uh, with this idea of, of black people being a commodity is that I saw in this museum where I uh, showed you before, there was a list, an, an inventory list of uh, goods that were uh, traded. And it said sugar, uh, tobacco, and slaves. So they were just calculating how much they would earn on tobacco, et cetera, and how much the slaves would cost them. So this kind of document, this document really created like the ultimate distance between something which is humane and something which is only based on, on profit or, or greed. I don't know what it is, but there was a complete wall between those two things. So that kind of shocked me in a way that I, I couldn't express uh, the hardness. You know, if you think about this, uh, about on a human level, on the human misery, kind of you go into this kind of rabbit hole where it's too much to bear. But taking away the humanity and making the scenes completely empty, uh, make this idea that is inhumane much more palpable than focusing on the suffering of those people. So this is what I wanted. I wanted the shell, the shell of the Dutch people, like the, the thing that left behind, the skeleton. I want to show that. And I want to show what the Dutch actually used that shell for. <laughs> around those land houses, around those walls, which are all fortified with cannons, were the, the kuniku, which are the slave houses. Of course, they were not inside the um, uh, they were not inside the perimeters, but they were just outside and they were used for plantation work, as you can see. But also, these houses were also standardized and 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 modular, as you can see. So this is one model of them, which is bizarre. I thought because when I first built this one, it sounds strange, but you can really easily stack them up. Uh, like you have with some of these bar glasses. So this is what I wanted. I wanted this idea of that the, these houses, these laser houses, were not an integral part of their whole infrastructure. I mean, it was left outside, so they kind of made a calculated risk that if these houses get bombarded or anything like that, they could deal with the loss of that. So it's not taken into account at all in the whole infrastructure. So what you have is all these hills with the rich Dutch families on them, communicating between each other uh, and kind of ignoring what's happening in the middle. So I was reading about sea battles with uh, England, for instance. They also had some stuff with Spain and Portugal. And they were shooting at ships in the ocean. And the English were shooting at the, at the Dutch land houses back. And it was just going over their heads. So all those people living there in those houses, I mean, they were just collateral damage in the whole thing. So I wanted to make this kind of feeling that you are looking at a, a kind of a space invaders, uh, moon base or something like that, which is completely alien. And then you see these kind of small houses uh, in the middle, which kind of de defines the scale of the whole, uh, of the whole scene. So again, I went really thoroughly and I used this uh, um, map again to place everything. As you can see the below, it has kind of a funnel shape. Um, the reason it's funnel shaped is because the camera is like really below. So I'm drawing a line to see where my camera is because the stuff outside, I don't have to build it. It's not in the picture. So it's just me being lazy. This is one of those land houses I designed. They were like particularly hard to design because they really, some of them were really complicated. Um, I can show you one.
So this was a particularly hard one to make. I don't know if you can see in the detail. Yeah. So I built uh, six of them in total of these ones. Kind of based on uh, actual land houses, but mixed up a little. These are these little units I talked about before and the cards below them. And you can see how small they are with the pencil next to it. This was the whole model uh, of this kind of uh, uh, battle, this kind of land, land C2C battle. As you can see here, like with the tools in the back, you can see the scale. It's about, I don't know, between eight and nine feet uh, in width, something like that. And here you can see a detail of the whole picture. I'm going to show the whole picture in a minute. And here you can see the combination also with the, with the kunyuku, the slave houses, and all these cards rolling around between. So only this shot, this detail shot, also had for me had the feeling of of a 17 size fiction film or something. These cars almost autonomously going around, and these houses are in between, kind of randomly placed. So how do I say this? Everything just doesn't fit, and this is why it fits so good, to my opinion. And this is the whole image together. As you can see, those kind of white, those yellow bows, those lines are kind of like the, the shells that are sent. And the English ship I mentioned before, it's right behind the fortress in the middle. So what you can see here is this, this big pan in the middle. You, the valley that you have in the middle is kind of completely ignored in a battle, although it's kind of the center of attention while those people were kind of shooting each other. So you're really not part of anything that happens there if you live in one of these houses. So it makes it painfully clear. This was the guy I saw in a museum. And um, there were not a lot of white people in the museum. Like, you know, you have some one or two sculptures. Most of the portraits you see and most of the sculptures you see is of black people. So the only white guy I meet in the museum has no face. So it was really like typical for me because I was looking for, for shells, you know, for protection, for things that are hollow and could keep stuff out and stuff in. So when I saw this, I think this is the ideal um, actor for this, uh, for this series. <clears throat> so I did a lot of sketches and variations on this, uh, on this guy, on this theme. And I kind of compared it as well with um, uh, alien space suits and stuff. And I made some drawings around this topic, as you can see here. I like the way the socks are like really like this. When I saw that um, list on the wall in, uh, in that museum, uh, the, the inventory list, I, it really uh, messed me up a lot. Actually, uh, I couldn't sleep uh, uh, for a while uh, because I saw that. And sometimes it was hot in my apartment that they gave me an apartment and I put the bed outside of the apartment and sometimes I, sl I just slept outside and then I kind of felt like that guy like uh, de de deflated and completely over hot and kind of uh, confused about my whole you know what's my whole role in this I mean how am I supposed to relate myself to this story which was really uh, a difficult process <laughs> um, for this guy I wanted to design this, the sketch I just showed. So I wanted to make this kind of um, uh, military guy uh, out of it. So uh, a commander or something. So I designed this suit. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. As you can see here, so everything is kind of designed with ornaments and stuff uh, to make a figure out of it. So I just, kind of rebuilt that figure I saw in the museum, but then with completely different outfit, of course. But I wanted to have him faceless and I wanted to have his socks. 
like really weak. Uh, so this is what I ended up making, which I personally kind of like because it has the colors, um, which are really rep representative for me. And I, I don't know, for this one, I, it's just spot on for my personal uh, experience with this whole uh, topic and uh, and series. Wait a second. Go, 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 go. So, yeah. These ships with these uh, floors uh, also had the idea I also had the idea of making them smaller, so pots inside pots, like like a kind of matrushka of pots. You know, you kind of um, the space shoot is actually also a pot, and the wider pot is then, for instance, a carriage. Um, so I was looking for those carriages, which are carried by two people. Um, I saw a, a very beautiful one in uh, in Brazil, and I used that as a reference. So this was actually something I wanted to make in that sense, uh, and also kind of tapping into the classic idea of science fiction, where this kind of pod, the idea of the pod opening up and uh, something or someone uh, coming out of that. So this is uh, the carriage that I found in Brazil. And um, I started to uh, kind of uh, rebuild that one, but redesign it as well. So I wanted to, this time I wanted to make a woman and I want her clothing uh, also a bit like the pot, like a complete kind of outer layer, which is completely embroidered and, uh, and decorated uh, for her as a kind of a hollow person. So I used wigs. I kind of designed wigs myself, as you can see here, uh, to print them out again, fold them in 3D. And then, as you can see here, make a wig out of it. Uh, and the fabric of the dress, as you can see here. And this is kind of the end result. The carriage. So these are in the total, I don't know how many there were, I think seven pictures. Uh, in total, I've shown you almost all of them. And yeah, I've given you a, a pretty good impression of uh, of what it's about. So uh, that was it. Thank you, Jasper. So I I'm open to questions, of course, and anything. So uh, I would like, you know, uh, as usually when someone has a question, they raise a hand, and I can see raised hands, uh, you know, through the button when you raise a hand. And uh, Jasper, if you remove uh, screen sharing, we will see you. Right. So uh, think about questions that you can ask this unusual artist. Meanwhile, I would like to share a comment and ask my question. It is uh, absolutely wonderful that you differ from many other artists that turn to history. Because these days, everyone wants to preach and everyone wants to revise history and tell us about their vision. Uh, you are not dogmatic. You are not inviting us to revise anything. You're just sharing with us your own vision um, and kind of reminding us how it may be used to be and I'm amazed that you go through all this pain of doing research, historical research, and then rebuilding it in minute detail. Now, here, here I found a difference. I've actually read about your work in Japan when you were artist in residence in Japan. And we know that uh, there are many, many artists who use computer animation and software and state-of-the-art software when they do manga magazines. And it's a crazy world in Japan, millions and millions of those. Uh, and they are all preoccupied with minute details. And you are not. You kind of planned your own little details there the way you want it. And uh, if, you know, we are used it 
to those effects that photography shows us what is there in front of a photographer, or if it's in the past, what was there in front of photographer, and we take it for reality of that moment, right? Okay. And you're and fooling us because <laughs> you are not showing us the reality. And I actually had to take a double take when I was looking at your work. Wait a second. No, 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 go back. Mm -hmm. This, you create your own reality. And this is where you draw us, and I'm very, very grateful to you. You draw us into your world, into your Curacao. I had no clue. Uh, February last year, I was sailing with my husband in West Indies. And we visited many islands and we were sailing on a Dutch boat. We visited many islands with these painted houses. We have seen them all. I never asked myself, how come they're so bright? Now I know. So there is a history lessons that you are giving through your photos. So this is the reason why I invited you because I was totally taken by your approach to history. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's really a big compliment. Yeah, Zina Taran, please. In English, please, Zina. Okay. Uh, that was fantastic. And I immediately started wondering what kind of changes that kind of a setup, and that's a very efficient way to run an operation, you know. So you're creating a wonderful, interesting, extra efficient operation on Curacao 200 years ago, whatever it was. So have you uh, given any extra thought to what? would they be doing with all of that? Like the, what, the, what kind of world would that eventually build? What kind of goods would those have been? Um, you mean if I extrapolate the, the idea? Hmm? Is that what you mean? If I ex extrapolate the idea that I have yes. here? Yes, yes. <laughs> That's a good one. The next project probably. <laughs> I think you can, I think there is a step behind this project we go we would go a little further. I have I have overthought this because every time you make a project, to my opinion, there is something called the ultimate consequence, and that means that when you extrapolate everything you have, every idea until the ridiculous, you get this situation which is kind of your your max, your hundred, and if you go there to your hundred, there's there's no way that you can actually recognize your whole starting reference. So kind of losing that and going into that hundred is like a really uh, integral part of the process. Because if you take a few steps back there, you don't lose yourself and you don't lose the audience. But if you go much further in that, you, the emotional part of it, it, it gets more violent, you know, it gets more uh, sour. Uh, it, it, everything kind of gets more. So it also gets more wonder but you cannot combine those two anymore once you're pushing it so far because the wonder will never ne kind of never win it from the sour so it kind of explodes in that way but that exploding part is for me is the hundred there it doesn't work right there so right before there that situation that that's what this is here thank you uh vladimir tarchelin please Uh, Jasper, uh, this outstanding show. Uh, Thanks. I have a question. So, all those photographs which are currently on display in ISIS Gallery, each of them exists as a single unique copy, or they might be produced in a larger number of copies? Uh, no, we have uh, an agreement on the photographs. There is an agreement that we uh, kind of uh, say up front how many copies we're going to make. So in this case, we have an addition of seven. And sometimes people ask, like, uh, why don't you print nine? I could do that. But then, uh, well, nobody would look at you again. So okay. there's the kind of gentleman's agreement on doing it in seven. And it's also illegal, by the way. So sometimes I, I had a few pieces that all kind of sold 20 over. So you, we had to stop at seven and then people get, yeah, is there a number eight, number nine? I said, yeah, I'm sorry, seven <laughs> is seven, so. Got it, thank you. Okay, 
Oh, just uh, Igor, you will be next, but uh, right on, on the tails of uh, uh, Valoria Torchilin's question. I, I know that I asked just, just before, but I would like him to tell all of you, what do you do with these meticulous maquettes that you are making for each set that takes probably hours and hours and days and weeks and months to produce? What do you do with them later? Most of them are gone. Destroyed. So yeah. yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years. And uh, first of all, there's no way to keep them all together uh, for so long. Uh, you have to move a lot. Uh, and uh, second of all, um, they fall apart after a while because they're not built to last. You, they're not built like sculpture. So if you move them around, which happens a lot, they kind of damage in a way. So I, I still have a few as reference not all of them. And third of all, most important reason that uh, these models are kind of used as a testimony. So they serve their purpose as a testimony. Uh, and when the testimony is done, they don't serve their purpose anymore. So the images are a reference to what happened to the model, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So when the model is gone, we have the same idea of a testimony as we have in Curacao. You know, it's, it's kind of a paper memory. And as you said in the beginning, uh, a picture is often like <coughs> a moment that you can say we've we've been there. You know, it's a, it's something that happened, and somebody pushed a button, and when he pushed that button, we also see what's happening here. So that's actually the case here. But for the rest, everybody gets duped. But that's the only moment that's actually true is that all that paper was together on that very specific moment and served its purpose. And then it can just go. It's, it's a perfect metaphor for history. It happened, it served its purpose, and it's gone. Yeah, exactly. And the interpretation is just something which you can only kind of like reach like when you have shadow, you know, with the Plato thing, when you have a shadow and you can't represent the real thing. It's just, you have to kind of reverse engineer history in that way. I just wanted to add something that the way um, when I hear Jasper speak, I think of it more how you treat a movie. When you watch a film, you're, you're, you know, behind all of that creation are so many physical things that cease to serve a purpose once the movie is made. Yeah. And we all go to the cinema or watch it on our screens and we accept that the end result is only the movie. It is nothing else. And I think uh, there's, there's a great deal of desire to see the physical beginning and middle of Jasper's process. But what he really wants fundamentally for you to do is to walk into a room and to see this very large image that exists somewhere between a book and a movie and a photo and a dream and a fact and a history. And it's kind of all of these things at once, but he fundamentally wants you to have that experience with that image that he's created, that he's used all of these different technical tweaks and things that he's interested in. But even so, all of those technologies and drawing and sculpture, they are only there to serve the purpose of this final image, which is then experienced by you, the viewer, putting in enough of your own knowledge understanding references just like you would with a movie that last that for especially that last sentence makes my makes it uh how to say this uh rep reciprocal that i get it back like mm -hmm. uh when i put this kind of stuff in i know that you can just use minimal reference to make a maximum effect because the language of photography but also the language of drawing and art is so specifically uh, sets that you can just pull some small strings to get a whole effect. So, and that's what it basically is. It's kind of like a puppeteer, you just pull, pull the right strings to get the idea of an image. I mean, we're dealing with ideas and, and, and representation here and not reality. I mean, reality is much more, reality is much too, too complicated and too, too layered uh, for me to slice it up like that. that that's, to my opinion, that's not my job to analyze it. My job is to analyze the fallout. Thank you. Igor Mandel. 
Well, yes, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, it's, it's very unusual, and thank you very much for this uh, presentation. It's very new technique. Thank you. I, uh, I, I know about, you know, stage photography. This is also kind of very specially staged photography, but I never heard about things like that. And my question is approximately like that. You demonstrated that you can draw a lot of things, and you definitely, you are the artist. And um, what actually um, kind of strike you a long time ago to do this kind of three-dimensional things instead of, for instance, making drawing and then making photo or using credit products or whatever. It's one part of the question because it looks like it's extremely cumbersome and complicated to make things for that instead of uh, let's say having a drawing or even picture. And second, up to what level of complexity could you go? Imagine that you wanted to create not a, a maquette of, let's say, the house, but maquette of the uh, whatever, beautiful uh, women. Would you do it uh, in, in with the same meticulous type of details? I said, just to have it uh, further to make photo of it because it's a very interesting way my impression is that you made 3d just because you would experiment when you put it finally to 2d as a picture you would experiment with different angles etc to make it better because you have real 3d on the other hand you should you might have 3d uh, digital image so in other words it's very interesting what actually draw you to make this specific type of intermediate media to make your final uh, product. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Um, when I did the academy, I uh, I spent all my time on drawing. Actually, I just was with uh, charcoal, always drawing, and I started kind of using models as a way to to kind of amplify my drawings. You know to find out some kind of stuff, how it's built. And I found out that these models were kind of powerful tools to find stuff out really quickly. Um, so somebody gave me uh, an, op an opportunity to be in an exhibition, a very small one. And they said, well, we only have this kind of limited space. I think it was one by two meters, which is like a four by uh, six feet or something like that. Uh, and then I said, you know, I can go either way with all my techniques because I was learning more techniques like photography and building and I really all love that stuff. And then I said, I just want 24 <laughs> pictures on that wall. That's it. So all, all the stuff that I learned, all the stuff that I've done, I kind of had to funnel it into one thing and those are those 24 pictures. So I really don't like rules, making rules for myself, but that was the first rule I made. It has to end up like in an old photo uh, roll, old camera roll with 24 pictures on it. So I just want 24 like small pictures. So, and then I understood that um, the idea of the testimony comes from the idea of the pictures. I mean, those pictures, the first one I ever did were kind of really intimate and almost random, which really gives them the feeling that you're kind of looking at something which happened and you obviously see that it's, it didn't happen. So first of all, it gave me the power of this idea of testimony that people use the tool of photography to kind of um, derive some reality out of it. But I could also use every single technique like my drawing technique and my building technique, um, but also in the, in the sense of direction and color um, to manipulate this image. So that made me the kind of the guy that can do this with everything. Uh, and that was such a powerful thing that I couldn't get around it. That made it uh, for me that before I had a frustration that I couldn't build a complete world if I wanted it. Mm. Uh, and there was always a setback in that. But if you do this, then the world is like in between a square. And if it's in between that square, square I can actually say like this has to be there and this is, it gives me com complete control over the world because I kind of 
force you to look that direction and not that direction. So when I realized that, I, I knew I had a, like a powerful tool to do everything I really liked. Thank you, Jasper. I just wanted to say a few words about beautiful women that you created. I'm totally into that old lady. And Igor, I invite you and I invite everyone to take another look at this old lady who is stepping out of the carriage. Look at her shoes, look at her stockings, look, look at her lace and gloves and the wig and also the padded interior of the carriage. It's also made. So don't miss a single detail. This is my absolute favorite photo of that lady stepping out of the carriage from centuries by gun. Thank uh, you. My comment. <laughs> uh, Father Edward, please. Uh, Jasper, thank you very much. It was very interesting and um, I'd say an expected presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's also, I don't know, I, I have a lot of questions, but uh, uh, I will uh, maybe ask only two. One is uh, that it was clear that all these models, objects, they're not big, they're quite small. It um, asks a lot of concentration, delicacy, and the very precise, I would think, manipulation of things. But you said it's important the hand touch in all of this. But my question will be not about the technique, but about uh, what is going through your head when you are making all these little details, because it must take time. Then you design these things, it's, it's in details. So what is going in the head of the artist that he said, I must design all these little things? <laughs> the, it's kind of split up in two answers. So yeah. uh, the first is like, why? Like why I start? It's like there's two guys. So there's one guy that designs this and then the other guy has to build it. So, but unfortunately that guy is me, the other one too. <laughs> so if I start and there's, it's simply no option to do it like semi, you have to do this completely. So one guy hates the other guy because he has to do everything. And every time I start, I go like, yeah, it goes like four months, maybe always, always goes to a year, two years because it's so much work. And if you say, yeah, I have to do this detail, I have to do that detail as well. So I think you have to be like horizontal in the way you give attention to stuff. Um, otherwise it doesn't work. I see somebody share coming in. Yeah. Tanya Gorling, would you please stop sharing the screen? <laughs> the mistake. Uh, Jasper, just continue. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and while I'm working on it, I mostly put up uh, a language course, to be honest, like learning Spanish or Portuguese. So, because I, you just have to kind of how do you say this? Like a rat running around in the little thing. You just yeah. have to keep your mind busy for that because otherwise you you don't think about it. It's a kind of rhythm, and then you go, oh, oh, oh bonjour, bonjour. And then you know you learn a language at the same time. Okay, thank you. And my second question is because you mentioned during your presentation that when you saw the reality of this island, you couldn't sleep. And this, uh, this exhibition came out of what I would call, maybe it's, uh, it's a wrong way, but you, uh, you, you should correct me in this case, of the emotional impact that it made on you, or, okay, temperature and the other things as well. But what is, uh, and now it's not only about your artwork, but about your reflection, uh, what is your idea of human progress coming out or what you've seen in the past that you design like the aliens? 
what what you think uh, uh, what what would you say you under the the people from Holland or Netherlands so went to other people uh, lands because they brought the progress the civilization and in order to this uh, a few things were uh, acceptable others were less acceptable or were acceptable in different ways and you reinverse a little bit all these values so what is your idea of the uh, uh, progress and the what i would call unity and diversity in our society currently yeah. Yeah, yeah, currently, yes, because you made this exhibition. So when should I leave in order to be better human being in the big white house on the top of the hill that can send lights or in the slave house downstairs? I think when we've uh, created a world with, with so much paper and stone and so much fabric between two people, I don't think I th I don't think we're on the right way there. I mean, a lot of stuff has changed for the better, but basically, I don't know. I, I have the feeling it just stays the same. There's just a maximum of human contact, and there's a minimum of human contact. I think, and there's this kind of a, like two borders on that: how how nice you can be or how mean. I don't know. I think that's like been in balance for thousands of years. I don't think that's going to change. Okay, thank you. Great, great. That's answer. why I don't, uh, you know, uh, you don't I'm not an idealist or something because, uh, yeah. So let me great just talk answer. about the phenomena and the shit that drops out of it. I mean, I can, at least I can do my part, you know? Okay. No, you know, it's interesting because, uh, thank you. Thank you, Father Edward. My pleasure. Uh, Natalie and Serge. It's Serge, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was an uh, excellent show and very beautiful, uh, especially this bombardment uh, picture. That was eerie, really. Uh, this little, um, you know, uh, homes down there. Um, but uh, your um, uh, it's not art only your works also kind of have some idea uh, behind it you um, address uh, you know uh, slavery uh, and that's a very touchy topic uh, considering like uh, you know popular opinions right now like uh, I just remember this uh, case with Amanda Gorman, uh, a black uh, a poet who actually recited her poem uh, when the, it was a uh, Biden inauguration. And then uh, there was this uh, excellent uh, Dutch uh, translator, Marika Richtenbeld, uh, who wanted to translate it uh, to Dutch but had to abandon the idea because kind of uh, she was told that it's a, it's a black person uh, only could understand what does it mean to be black. Uh, so it's uh, not a thing for a white person to touch this subject. So <laughs> my question actually, uh, did you experience any kind of pressure of this uh, of this type with your... Uh... No, um, I, I can tell you something really interesting about this. Um, uh, when I communicate this work in Curaçao uh, or with people from Curaçao uh, or maybe also mostly uh, a lot of black people in general, um, the thing is that the, the cynicism of the work um, they understand that immediately. So they don't see any double layer of something which is hidden inside the way I kind of fix all those things together, which kind of makes them look bad or something. They, in other words, they see it mostly, of course, and they go, yeah, of course, of course it's like that. 
So there's not a single moment I had to explain in Curacao giving a lecture or, or talking about this work that it actually is cynical. And the cynicism is something I have to explain to a lot of white people. And I don't know if the cynicism is not an integral part of that could be a possibility of a project like this. Um, maybe then we have like a long way to go. Thank you. The fact that it's cynical is so. Okay, let me put it differently. Suppose it was not cynical. This, uh, I mean, the consequences for me will be like really big. I mean, that will make me a really big asshole if it would not be cynical. So it makes completely sense for a lot of people that it's not. So, yeah, but I've heard some people that are afraid that I'm not cynical. So I don't know. I think then you miss two things, you know, first of all, you miss the cynicism itself. And second of all, maybe you have to take a better look at the messenger and not the message or, or the other way around, actually. I mean, yeah. it's what it says. And if you agree or don't agree, okay. But the cynicism, I never, I never understood that. Why I had to explain it to, to anybody, actually. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. This is a beautiful answer to a very difficult question. And uh, I must say that this is the third time this week where I am turned to James Joyce. Thank you to Vladimir Tarchilin. And I guess it was James Joyce who said that the thing of beauty is the one that has wholesomeness, is organic and uh, emanates light or something like that. And, and you come across as completely wholesome person. You are not afraid to use vocabulary from left to right and backwards, you're not afraid of words that maybe here in the United States, we are very I careful know. using. Yeah. So we appreciate that, all of that, which makes your art even uh, more honest for us. Thank you. That's, that's I just, like just say quickly, um, I followed Jasper for a much longer time than I've actually shown him. And one of the first series I saw of his was about Africa. And I like instantly felt really nervous that this is a white European artist making, you know, 3D sculptures of African bodies. And it was, it was about like a Western European news point of view of Africa. So it had the same levels of intelligence and Jasper calls it cynicism. I, I would call it other things as well, like a distance from just what you're seeing. So you're, you, you have to, as a viewer, bring your own knowledge, intelligence, and you have to trust that the artist is not an idiot. And then you will get the message of the artwork. But in every other way, I was so nervous to see it initially as an, basically as an American, even though I'm Russian born, but I'm, my, my cultural attitudes are entirely American. So I think, um, you know, this work was made, what, like 10 years ago, right, Jasper? A, yeah. a long time ago. So he's been doing uh, all of these kinds of, um, yeah, here's, here's a great example of it, right? Um, yeah. You know, and this, this to, to see this, even then, um, I, it's, it's brave. It's brave to know you might have some kind of like bullshit that you have to deal with from uh, a less nuanced perspective. But you know, Jasper's just gonna go and do what he wants to do and do it at the highest level of complexity. And if someone doesn't get that complexity, then it's it's on them. Yes. It's not his, it's not his job necessarily to you know answer every possible kind of uh, simplistic read on his work. Thank you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was nice. Igor, do you have another question or? Yes, go ahead. And uh, probably it's the last question. We have to let Jasper go. 
<laughs> we have to let him go. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very, uh, it's very, I would say, question which maybe is, okay. is an answer, which is, uh, have you ever thought about the fact that the slavery was abolished in uh, Denmark uh, and in Russia in the same year, practically, in 1968 in Russia and in 1963 in, uh, in Holland? And uh, so in Russia, about 1963, I think there is some kind of mistake, Igor. What? Do you mean when slavery was abolished? What? Uh, well, I just checked it in 1963. In, in 18. Maybe 18. You meant to say 18. 18, yeah. Uh, what yeah. did I say? 19. Oh, no, okay. it was 18. Sorry. Yeah, okay. It's, yeah. Uh, so practically so. the same. And in Russia, about 90% uh, of population were actually slaves. My question is, it's like very theoretical, you cannot answer if you don't wish. Did you think that would you have the same level of kind of, level of, kind of or, or to all those guys, all those guys. Think the majority of the population of the huge country, or you didn't think that way that slavery was so common at that time everywhere, especially in Russia, that Mm, it's it's different story. In other words, you would distinguish the Curacao and the huge, huge Curacao. Uh, either there are disturbances, and I think I, I get your question. Maybe problem understanding your question. So, Jasper, if you don't understand the question, you don't have to answer it. I I think I do. So, if I give the answer to a different question, then you know why. No, I don't. Uh, my question is: Is it the same type of thing which you you mean? The same type of slavery, the same type of strategy, etc. In those two situations, or different? Yeah. No, normally, it's not my position to kind of define. I'm I'm not a historical, so I can't define uh, a way of of slavery embedded in history as opposed to another one. But I can tell you that there was. Oh. A uh, oh, um, there was a treaty in the 16th century. Uh, can you maybe put your uh, mic off? Hello. Yeah, this is better. Everyone. Yeah, in the in the 16th century. Um, there was like a big beef between Portugal and Spain on how to divide the new found colonies. Um, because, you know, they wanted to draw a line across the world. And on the other side is Manila, you know, uh, uh, the Philippines. And then we have, uh, of course, Brazil and Mexico. So they all came together in a treaty. I think it's the, called the Treaty of Tordesillas. And what they did, the, the treaty was actually about do Indians have a soul? And they wanted to answer this question because if they could answer this question, they know how to treat those people. And the conclusion was actually because they found so many beautiful things in South and Middle America, buildings and poems, and everything that they kind of decided that they have a soul inside. Um, they also decided this about the black people, and they decided that the black people didn't have a soul inside. Um, so for the transatlantic slavery, that made the big difference because um, every order after this was based on the fact that you're not dealing with human beings. And how bad the slavery was in other places in general, um, this was never like uh, a policy point in that way in slavery and not for three centuries. Mm -hmm. So I do think that this is like a, a bigger operation uh, than one people enslaving another people. This is, this is much deeper and it's also going on for much longer. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more hands. I, uh, at some point, Sam mm -hmm. Gaysberg was... Uh, Waving. Sam, do you want to ask a question or no? Probably no. Okay, thank you, Jasper. Thank you very much. Thank you we for listening.
wish you all the luck and uh now people in new york would you please figure out evelyn i still have question okay, let's just do one more yeah <laughs> can you do one more jasper of course yeah okay. okay. Just real quick one, please lenny okay. okay do you hear me yeah mm -hmm. you you hear me yes okay um is there any connection between your work and AI, I mean artificial intelligence? Um, the concept of AI, there, there is a connection. I, I do have a project in my sleep which is connected to AI, but as for all projects like AI or any computer thing. I also already did something with VR. Um, but for me, it doesn't really matter what kind of technique it is, because it always has to serve the purpose of the project. So if the kind of project demands that I need AI, I'm going to use AI. If the project doesn't say I use AI, I don't. So it kind of follows up by what I want to do. I never take a toolbox up front and see what I can use with this toolbox. I just take the stuff in my head and then find the right toolbox. It's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, Sam, I see that you're waving the hand. Do you want- Yeah, but I only see your hand. I don't know just how to ask a question. Please Go ask ahead. a question. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we don't I, don't see I, was, I was thinking that, uh, did you try to make 3D models out of your models and then you can manipulate them on a computer and make your images even much more richer? So basically building something and putting it back in the computer? Yes, yes. You As a 3D model? Take your image, then you take 3D computer software and make three-dimensional model. I did that actually. Wait and a second. Even animate, you can do millions of things with it. And I it do. Also, be you can keep it forever. That is another thing. But Jasper's actually done a virtual reality. He's done all exactly every possible technology, computer game software. So this is all actually uh, stuff I found in Central Europe. This is about um, nationalism in Europe. And what I did, I every object you see in this image is scanned in a different museum in Germany, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. And this is the way I kind of uh, built this whole museum together. So here actually is oh, here. a conversion from a 3D object until until a 3D model, uh, which I could basically print out again, and then it's a 3D model again. So going into the computer, getting out of the computer, going in. Um, let me see the best one here. Um, this one, wait a second. So this theater as well is uh, completely uh, scanned in. You can scan stuff with a computer as a 3D model. So this exists in the virtual world, so to speak. So I, I can basically go both ways. <laughs> and I have uh, even a more interesting example. Wait a second. It's fascinating. So you can take Uffizi, you can take a Versailles, you can take a Hermitage and put all of this in one virtual uh, room and pretend that all the, this art exists in one room. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the way of getting it out of the computer again and printing it on 3D, for example. So for me, like between computer, reality and drawing, it's just one, you know, it's one blurry line, so. Uh, probably as close as being God as possible, my God. I will get into a lot of trouble if I say this. I said it. Okay. <laughs> no, let me just keep. I'm a humble servant with like a big toolbox. So that's why that's why I asked the question about any connections to Escher or Piranesi. 
Can you do it again? What? Uh, any connections, any thought or references to Escher or Piranesi? Because you're creating both real and fantastic worlds. Well, Piranesi was like, when I was 14, 15, like Piranesi was the bomb. I think the whole idea of, uh, I don't know, this kind of uh, the, I, the idea of the, of the emptiness of the roaming, that was like, when I saw that, I was really like, uh, and of course, um, you can kind of kitscherize uh, Piranesi, if you know what I mean. Like if you use that too much, I'm so fond of it that you kind of have to be aware that you're not making this kind of pastiche out of it or something. Mm -hmm. But I, I do have like levels of enjoyment. And when I see Piranesi, I go like, yeah, completely crazy. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You will hear a lot of feedback from us. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. So now uh, Asya is here on our side of the pond. So for her, it's still 8.30 at night. We're not letting you go for probably another 15, 20 minutes, Asinka. Um, this is a time for us to ask Asya questions about what it is actually to build and maintain a successful gallery in New York these days. Uh, we can ask this question as it pertained to pre-COVID time, how difficult it was to keep the business alive during COVID and what's going to happen post-COVID. So these are my questions. And another question is, how do you go about choosing your artists because your gallery is most unusual all the time? So well, I'll let you answer all these questions in any which way you want. Well, I'm going to start with that second one because Jasper is kind of a perfect example of um, the different pathways you can find somebody. So before I ran a gallery, I did lots of different things in the art world, but one of my best educations was going to art fairs. And basically an art fair is like a convention, but for art galleries, art collectors, art lovers, and, but I just went as an education and I saw his work in a fair that I didn't like hardly anything else. And I saw one image, it stopped me in my tracks and it was exactly because I couldn't understand it. I couldn't name it. It, it was, it, it hit so many instant um, fields of kind of excitement for me. I could tell it was about history. It was about culture. It was about something physically made. It was very much what Jasper just mentioned about not looking at the toolbox first, but getting the idea and searching around for the correct tool. That kind of thinking was instantly apparent that he wasn't just, oh, I'm fantastic with drawing. Oh, I can make a sculpture. Oh, I can make a beautiful image with a camera. These were all just tools to get to the execution of an idea. And I just, uh, I was fascinated with his work and it, it changed visually and physically and technologically with every series according to the needs of that series. So I followed him. I actually eventually ended up buying a photograph of his and um, I got to know his work over the years. And when I started the gallery, I knew I would show him right away. Um, but I, you know, since then, since having started the gallery, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by looking at art all the time. So I'm seeing a lot of art constantly. Um, but the key is to find an artist that no one else has found for a gallery like mine. So with Jasper, he had a huge career in Europe. He had a gallery in Italy, in Turkey, in Berlin, um, but no one showed him in America. And I just thought that was crazy. And I was very lucky to be the person to find him and force him to you know, start showing with me. But with other artists, in New York, it's it's a little bit harder actually because um, there's so many artists. So you have to think carefully about. Uh, it's kind of like being a book publisher, or maybe a movie producer. You you want to have a trademark. You want to show people something they haven't seen before, and all and everyone the artists you show have to have enough individuality compared to each other, but yet they have to also create a narrative, create a brand create a message that makes sense to 
everybody, to art viewers, art collectors, uh, the press, and just sort of a reputationally, so that, you know, if you go to the Hermitage, you know what that word means. And, you know, if you go to the mm -hmm. Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know what that means. And so that's kind of how you build a gallery such as mine. You want everyone to know that Ostic Iceberg Gallery means something. And in my case, um, it's mostly, I try to look for people like Jasper, people who visually are at the top, who, who don't think that they have to relegate visual craftsmanship, visual excellence, um, excitement, narrative, but that use all of those things to uh, excite your intellectual, your historical, your cultural kind of synapses. So while I do have painters who kind of are painting about painting, mostly still there's something there that, um, that has some deeper meaning that has meaning outside of just art or art history or um, you know, these are beautiful colors and how can I move them around to make a beautiful painting? And I'm not being disparaging about that, but um, for me personally, I want kind of all the different levels of interest usually to be answered by the artists that I represent. Um, to answer your COVID question, that's kind of, um, it's, it's been, let's say challenging because, uh, you know, going to a gallery is like the 99th thing on someone's list when they're told to stay at home. So it's been, and I, I didn't start a gallery just so I could call people and email people, even though that's a huge part of my business. So while the business survived because people were still emailing me and I have a lot of international and uh, national clients, but nonetheless, I want people to come and have a physical engagement and an encounter with that artwork. And you know, I hope all of you guys who enjoyed the Zoom will one day actually see that physical photograph by Jasper because it's so different no matter what his presentation, how exciting it was, like when you see it in person, you will have a different experience. And so, you know, I want people to come and show up and see the work on the walls that four or five weeks that I've got it up on the walls. So I'm very happy to have that all coming back. Pretty much since people have been vaccinated, it's been much, much better all around. So needless to say, you know, I'm much happier now. So yeah. And also like I, we did a lot of digital content. We did a lot of these Zooms. We did, you know, uh, different parts of our website. We developed more. We, we did everything, Instagram, everything we could to try to engage with people like what you guys are doing with this lecture series. So, but like I said, that, that doesn't take the place of that fundamental encounter with physical artwork. Uh, I say thank you very much for, uh, first of all, to make us discover this artist and for what you're doing. Two questions, and I think they're related or they're linked to get out together. The first one, just uh, a few minutes or seconds ago when you were talking about Jasper, you said you're looking for the deeper meaning that might appear at first sight. So my question is, what is this kind of the deeper meaning that you're looking for? So, so what, what, what is really uh, uh, working inside of you? I, 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 it's a little bit curious question, but I'm asking. Um, so the question is more about me. <laughs> no, that's no, but true. I mean, it's uh, the next it's, one will be about others. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, you know, my background uh, is in literature, history, and philosophy, and I think also I'm very lucky to both be have Russian parents, but you know, I only spent six years there, which I'm sure you can tell from when I speak Russian for five seconds, but still I did not. I both grew up American, but also fundamentally bicultural. And, you know, I, I speak French, I lived in France. Like, I think there's an element of my point of view that always has that kind of, not quite expatriate, but definitely like a cultural outsider in some ways. And so I do really get excited with both my international artists. I have someone from Iceland. I have actually another Dutch artist. I would love to work with someone from Africa, but you know, logistically it's quite challenging. Um, so I, I do respond very much to somebody who 
you know, since I'm in your group, I can say this, but someone who doesn't have like a kind of very dumb American, like lack of history perspective. And, you know, for me, Jasper, just like he's, his, his research and the way he thinks, the way he makes these connections, I, it, it's not how I'm gonna make a connection necessarily, but that's what's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy to make art about slavery. Like, yeah, it's bad, we know, what's, the, what's your point? How can you possibly, it's like making a, a Holocaust movie in 2021, like what, what more can you say? But he does it and he does it in his way and he's very both ambitious, but also very humble in knowing that, you know, he said to you guys, he's not a historian. He's not gonna speak about Russian serfs, but, but in, in some ways he's his polymath aspect that he's interested in everything. Um, that's very appealing to me. And I think with many artists, it's not just artists, but artists, I guess is what I know best, you know, you, you wanna stand out so much that you go interior, you go deeper and deeper into what is it you have to say. And the best balance for me of a artist, a writer, anybody is who can go in, but constantly take things from the outside. And the more you take from the outside and you can put it in your own little blender, come out with something that we haven't read that book before, we haven't heard that point of view before, we haven't seen it before, then that to me is what what's exciting and and attractive about people who are creative and who just keep wanting to do some something new thank you and the second question is uh i i, I will start with the story and you will understand it because if i understood you well you went through the whole process of the liberal art education so uh, that, that that's absolutely obvious uh, you know, then Moses saw the burning bush. He said, uh, I will make a detour and to see why it's burning, but not uh, falling into ashes. And it looked to me listening to you that what you're trying to do with your gallery, it's to make people uh, to take a detour, you know, like a little bit go to see what you've never seen but what are your means as the director of the gallery to make people to go to see uh you know every like everybody else just constant promotion and constant trying to get uh get into the right eyeballs so to speak so that um the work of my artists enters into a bigger, richer, wider conversation and not just them and their studio and their three friends and whoever's supporting them. So that's kind of the exciting slash challenging level that, you know, where I am in the center of New York's art world, there's, you know, 300 galleries within blocks of me. And, and we, we go to all the same art fairs and we're trying to get all the same, like three New York Times critics to come to our shows. So, you know, the same seven huge collectors or 10 big museums. So we're all trying to do that. Um, and, you know, all you can really do other than just the business end of it is to find the best Jaspers. So, you know, for me, no matter what, I feel like as long as my artists are on his level, um, that's my best foot going forward, you know? Otherwise there's, otherwise you are just kind of marketing I don't know how to say that. Yes, yes. I right. understand. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you again. I think that you answered all our questions, Asinka. Is there anything that I think you liked us the way we liked you, the way we liked your Jasper? Hopefully, there will be more connection in the future. Please keep sending us your wonderful emails. Uh, I will allow Father Edward to wrap it up because Father Edward always makes everything good, even nicer. Uh, I, 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 I have a, a question that comes out from the what you've said on one of the previous questions. You, you've said, I want to people look at the real art. So I will make a provocative question to you and to Evelina. Can you be 
uh, let's say, kind to all of us and come back and to talk to us what is the real art is? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah. So I that's guess. my question, really. <laughs> the best rather than question, probably. Asya, thank you so much. And we are all staying here for as long as whoever wants to talk. We are still talking. And Asinka, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Evelina, yeah. I read in Russian, because I have a lot of Russian languages. I just thought that this person, мог бы подавать заявление на должность начальника плановой комиссии или архитектурной комиссии любого большого города, и он бы наверняка прошел бы по своему резюме и зарабатывал бы совершенно сумасшедшие деньги. У него настолько ясное и четкое представление о композиции чего-то, в частности города, местности, ландскейпинг. Я просто удивлен, честно, честно, честно говоря. Это удивительный, удивительный взгляд, обобщенный взгляд на ландскейпинг и на то, что должно быть внутри него. Я, я просто восхищен его умением из идеи создать образ. Это наверное, это, наверное, есть в нынешних компьютерных играх, наверняка. Но у него это вышло на какой-то совершенно другой уровень. Ну, просто, просто очень, очень здорово. Спасибо, Евгений. Мне очень понравилось, что о, у кого-то телефон там, да. Мне а очень я... понравилось, что у него он мыслящий, он просто мыслящий художник. Я не знаю, бывают ли не мыслящие, но было бы, наверное, проще видеть много портретов, так как мы привыкли видеть, допустим. Ну ладно, на следующей неделе у нас будет Гриша Брускин, поэтому мы сможем сравнить. Но тут видно, что он каждый раз, допустим, раз там в 3-4 года окунается в какую-то атмосферу, базируясь на своей идее. И он поехал в Японию лет 10 тому назад, по-моему. Он-то был artist in residence. Ничего себе быть artist in residence в старинном японском городочке, где все вертится вокруг истории, гармонии. И это бабу шаби, то есть это старинное понятие о том, что не все должно быть perfect, жизнь есть жизнь. И он очень хорошо вписался туда. И работы, которые он там делал, все равно были standing out, то есть они были заметны. Вот. Ну, в общем, короче, нравится он мне очень. И мне нравится, как он очень хорошо парировал провокационные вопросы от некоторых наших друзей, которые пытались его в какие-то политические русла э, свернуть. Но очень правильно отвечал, не моя задача э, решать все эти проблемы. Я художник, я по-другому на это смотрю. И надо сказать, что его деминер, как по-русски деминер, его персона, ора его, очень даже вписывается в команду Dutch Sailors. Вот я привыкла на паруснике быть в команде. С они все очень straightforward, они точно знают, где лимиты их экспертизы, интересов. И так далее, и, и anything they never, they don't bullshit, they mean it, как-то. Ну вот, собственно, я довольна этим вечером очень, я довольна, как люди участвовали в этом. Ивелина, вот к, к вопросу о том, что вот ты, ты говоришь, и вопрос предыдущий. Дело в том, что во всех же этих вещах есть разница менталитета. И культурный, исторический менталитет, он в Европе, поскольку все-таки мы говорим о Европе, он очень заметен не в тысячах километрах, а в 35 километрах. И есть большие отличия. И иногда, скажем, людям, которые выросли в России, в Соединенных Штатах или в Канаде, 
им очень тяжело, то есть нам очень тяжело предполагать, вот когда я разговариваю со своими братьями французами, там, англичанами, итальянцами, они знают каждую деревню на каждый пятый километр. Mm -hmm. Спросите каждую деревню на каждый пятый километр в Соединенных Штатах, в Канаде или в России. В России нет, в России нет. В России нет. пока что, пока что. Нет, я просто почему говорю, это накладывает отпечаток на целостное отношение к жизни, на том, как делается, то есть представляется стол, обустраивается дом, как относится к деталям. То есть и наш подход к этим вещам абсолютно разный. Я вижу, опять же, вот разницу в подходах. И поскольку я живу в интернациональной монашеской общине, которая из разных стран, я вижу нашу разницу, например, кто приезжает, даже эта разница даже в странах. То есть, например, кто приезжает из Демократической Республики Конго или кто приезжает из Камеруна. Понимаете, мы говорим о каких-то латиноамериканцах. Дело в том, что латиноамериканцы не существуют. Это наш придуманный концепт, а есть мексиканцы, аргентинцы. То есть также африканцев не существует. Есть конголицы, есть камерунцы, есть там бенинцы. Но ну, это накладывает отпечаток. И вот, в, например, в Голландии то есть, очень видно, вот то, о чем говорил Игорь Юдович. Ну да, это детали, это планировка, это продумывание, это все заранее. А не так, как я не буду вдаваться, Евелина, в политическую инфраструктуру, но вот, например, в Канаде, в Квебеке есть вот одна партия, которая борется за независимость Квебека. И у них много молодежи. Я пошел как-то на одну из их выступлений, я им задал вопрос. Ну хорошо, ну вот будет у независимый Квебек. А какой он будет независимый Квебек? Они говорят, ну мы посмотрим. Понятно. То есть вот у Джаспера этого нет. То есть это продуманность. Прежде чем даже что-то сделать, это надо продумать, это очень видно. Но это было очень-очень интересно, очень интересно. Яспер, в частности, идет от идей к ее воплощению. Но на самом деле это не только вот это направление. Скажем, вот он рассказывал про Карасау. Он увидел, как выглядел этот дом, как выглядела крепость. Он увидел, как выглядели музеи, скажем, как выглядели другие дома, как выглядели дома тех, кто работал на плантации, так далее. он увидел много физического. И вот оттуда, в обратном направлении, тоже пошла творческая работа. Так что она идет в двух направлениях. Не просто только вот тут есть идея, и надо потом посмотреть, как ее воплотить. Угу. Да, но, безусловно, толчок дает физическое восприятие. От чего-то надо оттолкнуться, а потом уже развивать свой внутренний взгляд на это. Это как бы... Он же не философ, сидящий в кабинете, он же человек мира. Ну, может быть, можно сказать, что идея все-таки его привела на Курасау, насколько я понимаю. У него, была, у, него, у него была идея узнать, что там.